The Minnesota House Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice Reform for the 92nd State Legislative Session will come to order. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Mariani. Present. Vice Chair Frazier. Present. Representative Johnson. Present. Representative Edelson. Present. Representative Feist. Present. Representative Grossel. Present. Representative Hollins. Present. Representative Hewitt. Present. Representative Cleveland. Cleveland, present. Representative Long. Present. Representative Lucero. Present. Representative Mueller. Mueller, present. Representative Novotny. Novotny, present. Representative O'Neill. O'Neill, present. Representative Pinto. Present. Representative Poston. Present. Representative Raleigh. Raleigh, present. Representative Vang. Present. Representative Shong, excused. And that concludes roll call. Very well, there is a quorum. Uh, members, this hearing is being conducted under Minnesota House Rule 10.01, allowing for hearings to be held via use of distance voting, remote electronic voting or voting by other means to protect the health and safety of the public, staff and members. The hearing is live streamed on the House website and can be accessed by visiting the, this committee's page. Also on that page, um, for those wishing to offer public testimony, um, there's a listing of the email address for our committee administrator, Mr. Jamal Lundy. Um, those wishing to offer uh, testimony can email Mr. Lundy 24 hours prior to a hearing. Um, and again, that email address is on the committee page. Uh, members, we have uh, three bills up today, two uh, that will be formally uh, before us and one that will hold as an informational uh, hearing. And um, today's uh, theme is Survivor Equity Advocacy Day. A quick reminder to all members, I know it's uh, way out in the future, but next Tuesday we will be holding an evening uh, companion hearing or continuation rather of, of our regular uh, hearing time um, on Tuesday. Um, it will be hopefully knock on wood the only time that we will hold the evening hearing. I can't swear by that, uh, but that's certainly the chair's uh, intent. So please uh, uh, make uh, accommodations to your calendar uh, accordingly. Uh, with that, our first order of business is to adopt the minutes of March 1st. And uh, Vice Chair Fraser, would you be kind enough to make the appropriate motion? So move, Mr. Chair. Very well. Representative Fraser moves adoption of the March 1st minutes of this committee. Members, discussion? I should pull up my hands. Very well. Uh, Representative Johnson, I think a voice vote. Okay. That would, that would be fine. Very well. All in favor of the Fraser motion, please say aye. 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 All same sign. Motion prevails. And the minutes of March 1st are hereby adopted. Uh, members, um, our first bill up today will be House File 3055 by Chair uh, Becker Finn. Um, this is Missing and Murdered Indigenous Relatives. Information reward fund established and money appropriated. You all will recall that a couple of uh, years ago, uh, this committee and our body took, uh, in my opinion, a historic first step um, in uh, addressing uh, this, frankly, centuries old uh, issue of violence uh, perpetrated against uh, indigenous uh, people. And um, we have since uh, created an office uh, specifically focused on the equity issues um, um, that all of that brings. Um, so with that, um, Representative Fraser, if you would also be kind enough to move. Actually, we don't need a motion. We're going to lay this over. Uh, and so member, well, we don't need a formal uh, committee referral motion. We would normally be referring this to the Ways and Means, but it is the chair's intent to lay this bill over for inclusion, possible inclusion in our omnibus bill. And so with that um, uh, intention, the, bear, the chair calls for House File 3055. Uh, chair Becker, your bill is before us. 
Buju Niju and Aquatic Way in Indigenous Leech Lake Nindunjaba Makwa Nindodem. Really, uh, thank you, Miigwech, uh, Chair Mariani, uh, for letting me uh, bring this bill forward. And as you mentioned, this has been an ongoing conversation in the legislature for at least the, at least since I've been in office. And um, this bill is just the next step uh, in moving this issue forward and uh, bringing our relatives home. And I really want to, I think this is one of those bills where the title of the bill really says it all. It's a reward fund um, for information on missing and, mit- missing and murdered Indigenous relatives. It's $110,000. It's a small ask with big impacts. And with that, I want to really make sure that our time is given to listening to the voices of those most impacted by this issue. And so with that, I would turn it over to my testifiers. Very well. And I do see uh, five testifiers before us. Um, I do want to apologize ahead of time to all my friends here. Um, if, I, if I move you along, uh, only because we, uh, we have uh, three bills we want to hear and lots of voices here today. So please uh, do not take any offense. Uh, this is a critically important uh, issue. We want to honor uh, your our relatives' uh, experiences and your presence here uh, with us today. With that, we will begin uh, with um, the family of Sheila St. Clair. Um, and then my understanding is uh, Chair Becker Fenn's testimony will be read uh, by, uh, I only have a first name here, Renee. So let me uh, ask Renee to come forward, please. Please state your name for the record and then uh, provide the testimony. Bonjour. Uh, my name is Renan Goodrich. I am a MMIW-G2S, MMIWR advocate um, for missing and murdered indigenous peoples, um, working in the Twin Ports area, Native Lives Matter Coalition. And I'm here to share um, about our, our new reward fund that we established in Duluth, and also to um, mention that the reward fund, Gagi Gay McWenda, McWayne Goziwag was created. It's a community response reward fund created with the city in partnership with the city of Duluth, Native Lives Matter Coalition, and Mending the Sacred Hoop. So we're really proud to be a part of this reward fund. So uh, we wanted to share a little bit about that. But most importantly, um, the reward fund is. Um, inspired by our current open missing case that we have, and that would be for Sheila Sinclair. Uh, Sheila Sinclair's daughter was invited. However, she won't be able to join us today in testimony, but she will be, she will be on live stream. And we wanted to uh, say her name, Sheila Sinclair. Um, Sheila has been missing from the Duluth area. Um, I'm sorry about looking at my notes to hopefully, and I wanted to share from families. Um, We're honored to be able to um, help share words directly from Sheila St. Clair's daughter, Stephanie St. Clair. She wants to thank the committee to please um, um, support the um, legislation moving forward to support all of our relatives. Sheila is a sister, she is an auntie, mother, a grandmother, and she's a friend to many in the Duluth area and throughout Minnesota. Her daughter currently lives in the upper in upper northern uh, Minnesota Bemidji area. Um, in August of 2015, Sheila went missing from the Duluth, from Duluth, Minnesota, and she was last seen uh, uh, on the 100 block of West 3rd Street. She is still being sought by her family and friends and relatives, and it and it her case is an open case with the city of Duluth. The investigation continues. Um, for over six years now, Sheila Sinclair has has not been found, and Gaki Gay McQueen Da Gosiwag Reward Pro- Program is a community response reward um, program in collaboration with the city of Duluth, Native Lives Matter Coalition and Mending the Sacred Hoop to help um, bring Sheila Sinclair home. 
She's the inspiration for our reward fund. The donations, um, the reward fund is supported by donations. And um, it's the first of its kind in the state of Minnesota, established in Duluth, um, January 10th, 2022. We are honored to be able to be a part of the um, program uh, with community partners. Building on the Indigenous-led community response model, um, MMIW and MMIW G2S families, their advocacy and their indigenous um, and indigenous communities are empowered and honored um, by the support of our state legislators in establishing the state statewide reward fund. Families are on the front line, the foundation for the movement, and is their advocacy that is the original community-led, indigenous community-led um, response to the epidemic in the movement. So by empowering, um, by creating these reward funds locally in, a, in smaller communities and, and also statewide, we're empowering our families and our, and our advocates that are, that are working in, on this issue. Together, we can help bring closure and justice, and we can bring the change that is needed to promote healing and resiliency for families. And in doing so, we're building strong, resilient communities. I want to thank you for, um, for allowing our testimony and, um, uh, and our inclusion um, in testifying here today. And we offer our strong support in in the creation of this reward fund statewide. It only encourages um, further healing and um, the justice that, that families are seeking. And I want to say thank you so much for having us here today. Jimmy Gwetch. Thank you, Ms. Goodrich. Um, I, <clears throat> I believe I do speak on behalf of um, every member of this committee um, in saying that we stand together uh, with Sheila's family in wishing her safe return and extending our desire for peace and healing um, to her family. Mm -hmm. um, we are honored that you are here with us and sharing um, your, her family, uh, your community's efforts to mend that sacred group. Thank you. Jimmy Glitch. Next, uh, we have uh, Sharon Day. Executive Director of the Indigenous Peoples Task Force. Ms. Day, if you can please come forward, state your name for the record and give us your testimony, we would be privileged. Abuju Nagmo Maingan Indichnagaz. My English name is Sharon Day. And um, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, um, grateful to, to be here today um, and to, for the opportunity to speak to the committee. Um, every Native person is affected by violence um, towards our women, our children, our relatives, and especially two-spirited members of our community. Today I'm speaking on behalf of my sister, Cheryl Day Early, and my niece, Karina Day Early. Um, Karina's Ojibwe name is Wabishke She Koi. She was born on December 30, 31st, 1991 and was killed on May 22nd, 2018. They found her with a bullet through her heart and ruled it as a suicide without any investigation. Uh, what woman shoots herself through the heart? Her boyfriend, um, who was, uh, as we say, Chmokaman, uh, was abusive and he was also a gun collector. Uh, today, he, he is living uh, his life um, in northern Minnesota with another Native young woman. And, you know, um, Karina was living in Tower. They have uh, two police officers. And um, he did not call the police until a half hour after she, she died. And... Um, in which time he had time to shower. And um, anyhow, 
um, if there was such a reward, you know, maybe somebody from the community would have came forward um, to provide some information to the to the local police. This did not happen on a reservation. It happened on a small town near the reservation. Anyhow, you know, how long, how many times do we, our community have to endure um, these losses uh, to our families? Um, there needs to be the campaign to educate people um, that uh, fully support the creation of um, this, this advisory committee and also to offer rewards. You know, in our community, we're, we're, we're not, many of our, you know, my sister's family, they didn't have money to offer for a reward, nor did they even have enough money to hire an attorney to assist in the investigation. Um, and, you know, it took them months to even get a copy of the death certificate. So um, I just want to ask you to support this um, house file 3055. Um, um, thank you, Miigwech. Thank you, uh, Ms. Dan. We grieve your loss um, and we, um, we hope uh, that our actions can be part of your closure um, with your loss and, and part of your healing as well. Thank you for your testimony today. Um, members, next we have um, Alicia Kozlowski. Uh, from the city of Duluth. Uh, Ms. Kozlowski, if you can come forward, give us your name uh, for the record and give us your testimony, we would be, uh, we would be privileged. Good afternoon, Chair Mariani and members of the Minnesota House Public Safety and Criminal Justice Reform Committee. Uh, my name is Alicia Kozlowski. Um, and I want to say thank you for all you do in service to Minnesota. Ozawa Anakwadukwe in Indigenous Cause is my Ojibwe name. It means yellow cloud woman. In my English name, as I shared, is Alicia Kozlowski. Um, I'm really humbled to be here on behalf of the city of Duluth with the Gagige Mikwenda Goziwag Reward Fund, as well as on behalf of Kwepak, which is an indigenous women's collective based on the Fond du Lac Reservation, all in unified support for House File 3055. A recent study by the Urban Indian Health Institute revealed that only 116 of the 5,712 MMIW cases were logged into the Department of Justice's nationwide database. 70% of those were declined due to lack of evidence. Uh, we know the statistics are difficult and staggering. Um, these aren't just statistics as we've heard. These are our moms, aunties, sisters, cousins, your neighbors. According to the Minnesota MMIW report, on any given day, there are between 27 and 54 Indigenous people missing. As you've also heard, that includes Sheila St. Clair, our treasured relative from Duluth, and I could name on and on and on the members within our communities who are missing. When people are missing, that changes the story of our families forever. And if any of us had a family member taken, we would do whatever we could to find them. And it's that deep commitment to people to indigenous peoples at field, as you also heard, the city of Duluth, our law enforcement, nonprofits and grassroots groups to collaboratively establish the first of its kind, MMIW G2S Minnesota named the Gagige Mikwanda Goziwag, meaning they will be remembered forever. Like the Duluth Reward Fund, House File 3055 will provide renewed hope and a missing link for more effective investigations through financial incentives that will yield critical evidence needed to bring our people home to justice and promote healing. This fund won't bring somebody back, but it will let people know there's value in them opening up and sharing the information that they know, that they hold in their being. This isn't just an indigenous issue though, it's a human issue. When any of us are dehumanized, we're all dehumanized. All of us carry parts of this MMIW epidemic in our stomachs, in our hearts forever lodged there. And we need to be reminded that we're not only survivors, but that we're victors. And so together with a good heart, we can move towards that healthier future free of violence with these sustaining investments of monies and resources to tackle this epidemic. Our ancestors, I know our daughters, my daughter, our relations are counting on us. And so again, miigwech for your support of House File 3055 
and the continued transformational work that you are doing and playing a part in creating a Minnesota where we can all thrive. Thank you. Thank you, Officer Kosowski. We appreciate the work that you do. Uh, we appreciate your insight that you shared today and your wisdom uh, as well. Um, and hopefully we can um, respond to your call and helping to create a tool that can aid you in your work and um, aid our and equip our families who are missing loved ones. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, we have uh, Chief Mike uh, Tuscan of the Duluth uh, Police Department. Uh, Chief Tuscan, uh, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and give us your testimony. You might be muted. Thank you, Chair Mariani uh, and the members of the committee. Uh, I come to you from my vehicle. I had a dear friend's uh, funeral I was attending and I, I'm coming to you from Belle Plaine. Uh, that said, I do appreciate this opportunity to represent the city of Duluth and uh, the Duluth Police Department in our work to find and bring Sheila St. Clair home. Uh, you know, one of the primary roles of government is to protect its people. And uh, we, as a city, uh, as a community, were unable to uh, have a proper reward to offer to give us that information that we desperately need to solve this case. We know that people out there have information that would lead to perhaps uh, bringing Sheila home, but also to hold uh, people into account. And we have relied upon the good graces of our community to reach out and to support. And I, I'm happy to share that we've raised nearly $10,000. That said, we know that in Duluth, uh, our, our indigenous communities are six times more likely to be victims of crime. We know that that's not just a trend in Duluth, that's a trend that is not only across our state, but nationwide. This bill will be incredibly helpful for us to have the resources to use to bring people forward who may be scared, who maybe need a little influence to come forward and share their information. The, this committee did a remarkable job as Chair Mariani said at the beginning of this call, in uh, putting forth a comprehensive study on missing and murdered Indigenous women and, and girls in Two-Spirit. The study uh, points to really three primary causes why this is happening. Colonialism, uh, racism, and the object, objectification of our Indigenous women and girls in Two-Spirit. And so we know that in order for us to be able to have safe communities for all, we have to have the tools necessary to bring people to justice, to have accountability, to keep people safe and well. And this bill will be incredibly uh, helpful for us to have, not have to go out into community to ask for their help, but to have resources available for us to use to get the information we need to solve these cases. One of the only uh, unsolved murder cases we have in the city of Duluth is a uh, case in, in which two Indigenous people were murdered uh, that we were never able to solve. We had a suspect who has now passed away that we perhaps may never solve it. But these cases, we work tirelessly to solve them, uh, to represent our community, to re represent all in our community. And if you give us this tool, uh, this is just one more uh, uh, tool that we can have to uh, perhaps solve these important cases and to hold people into account. And so with that, um, I know that you have many people to hear and see. Uh, I think this legislation is, is really important for us in law enforcement to have to, to help bring home uh, those who are missing back to our communities and also hold people into account. And I appreciate your time and consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Um, it's certainly not lost on the chair that uh, you are joining us in your moment uh, of pain and loss. Um, and um, obviously, um, driven by your desire for, uh, for good public service to our people. So I, I just want to acknowledge and extend my condolences to you and your loss. And thank you for your work on behalf of the people of Minnesota, specifically those in Duluth, and for your solidarity in walking with our indigenous. Um, uh, communities and friends and neighbors and loved ones uh, in Duluth. Uh, with thank that, you, Chairman. Thank you, Chief. 
Uh, with that, uh, members, we'll, we'll open this up uh, for discussion and or questions. And I do see Representative Poston uh, has his hand up. Representative Poston. Thank you, Chair Mariani. Uh, my questions are for the bill author. Uh, Representative Beckerfin, um, one of your testifiers, I believe it was Mrs. Goodrich, said this is the, the first of its kind in Minnesota. Um, did you go out and, and find programs like this in other states? And, and if you did, are they successful? Are they working? And it's a separate question, but did you think about also putting a cap on the rewards? I don't see one in your bill. Um, so those are my questions. Very well, uh, Chair Becker Fair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and, and Representative Poston. I'll, I'll ask the second. I'll answer the second question first. Uh, subdivision six is that there is a reward cap. We we left that blank for right now, but we did um, consider that that would that would be something we'd want to include. But I, uh, you know, wanted to have this uh, fully vetted in the public sphere uh, as we talk about what that might be. Um, as to this is unique, and what Duluth is doing is really. Uh, really very unique. And I think especially at this point in history and in time and where we are for um, the community and law enforcement to completely be on the same page that this is a good idea um, and that this will have an impact, I think, you know, needs to be mentioned because it's very important. Um, you know, I don't, to my knowledge, there aren't other states doing this, but that doesn't mean we can't be the first ones. We were the first ones to do the MMIW task force. We were the first ones to set up an office and, uh, the, the chair freeze. I think the, the take home message is that, the, uh, Sorry, Mr. Chair, can you still hear, hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh, we, we need to be able to uh, look at different different possibilities for how to move things forward on this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Poston? Representative Beckerfin, thank you. Uh, you're, you're right. It's, it's okay to be first. Um, you know, uh, I'm glad that we are. And uh, I'll just make one comment uh, and then go on to other questions, other people's questions. But I will just hope and I will also pray uh, that this does help, that this does make a difference. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative Poston. Uh, Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just, I wanted to thank uh, Representative Becker Finn for doing this bill. Um, it's, I remember way back when, when then Representative Kunish Pudin, who now is a senator and has changed her name, and I were working on some of these things together. And, and I shared something rather personal back then. And it's funny because I was just, I was thinking about it again um, just this last week. And my, I'm going to call him my brother, even though he was a foster brother. We in, embraced him into our family when he was 10. And uh, his older brother, who was 17 at the time, and I'm still in really close contact with Alan, who is my, he was 17 when he came to stay with us when he was uh, as a foster kid. But his younger brother, Frank, moved to Texas and um, he just disappeared one day. We don't know, to this day, we don't know where he is. We don't know what happened to him. We, there's never been, his body has ever been recovered. We don't know for sure if he's alive or dead. We don't know. He, you know, when kids are in foster care, they, they have a little bit of a different life and sometimes he would kind of drift. So we really don't know where he is. And my heart is with the families that have experienced that loss. When you, when you don't know, I mean, I was young, right? When he came into uh, our family, I was very, very, very little. And the loss is just tremendous. And I can't imagine the pain that the mothers that have talked about their losses today have gone through because um, he was a brother. He wasn't you know, my own child, but I just want to offer my support and my encouragement and to understand that um, there are some of us on the other side of the aisle that really do care, really do support this. And we want to see these missing and murdered people. First of all, we want the missing people come home. We want the murdered people to have justice. So 
that's my thanks to um, Representative Becker. Thank you, Representative O'Neill. Um, thank you for reminding us that um, there are things that unite us in our humanity and the need for closure and healing um, and um, to know uh, about our loved ones is um, it, it's a universal call. I, I thank you for sharing a, a painful story um, with us and reminding us of that. Um, next will be Representative Rowley, then we'll go to Representative Johnson, then we'll uh, proceed uh, with closing comments from uh, Chair Becker Fed. Representative Rowley. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, since this is a first time that we're going to be doing this, one of the uh, things that we've talked about in this committee previously, and I'd like to offer to the author is um, somewhere in the bill um, taking uh, language that would um, instruct, I don't know the right word for it, um, to report back on what the findings are because I think this is amazingly important. And I, I think that a focus on being able to provide additional tools to you know, bring this under control and and I've got a lot of words that you know I, I don't know how to use because this this just seems to be so important. Um, but I'd like to make sure that in the after uh, after the awards or the the uh, incentives have been awarded, where did they go? What was the amount that was used? And then I don't know that we need to put this into the bill, but I, I think it would be instructive to the organization that's put together uh, the the task force is. Um, I kind of uh, give them my uh, uh, let them know that we want to hear back. You know, did they try a couple different approaches, uh, whether that's you know monetary or other incentives? Were there things that were more successful or less successful? And then how do we measure this? And how do we make sure that you know maybe when we revisit this, uh, there'll be a better reason why the allocation and the appropriation could be in the future more. If needed. And then Chair Becker Fed. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And you know, I, I think that's a, a great suggestion as far as a report. You know, this would also work in concert with the you know permanent missing and murdered indigenous relatives office. So there's certainly some oversight already there. Um, the director of that uh, agency would be part of the discussions ongoing. But if it if it gives people uh, some comfort, you know, I'm I'm sure they'll be keeping track of everything. So it's just a matter of uh, putting it in a format so folks can understand. Um, you know, we want it to be successful. Uh, so yeah, I don't I don't see any problem with doing that. Mr. Raleigh? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for uh, that inquiry. I, I share your um, your desire, um, uh, whether it be this or anything else, in terms of what 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 do we learn? Um, how do we become better? Um, how do we make sure there's good strong accountability of, of, of public resources? Uh, so very appropriate uh, inquiry. It sounds like the chair is uh, willing to um, uh, work on something like that. With that, then, uh, Representative Johnson. Uh, chair Mariani, Representative becker -Finn. I understand the need for this. Uh, what's going on there is uh, tragic, but what's going on everywhere is tragic. Uh, the rewards can be very helpful at times. Uh, hopefully it does work because we need to get those that uh, doing these, uh, especially on the homicides, to get them behind bars where they belong so they don't affect any other families and have any, any more victims. I know it, it's hard for communities to raise the funds. A lot of don't have a lot of funds. In fact, uh, tomorrow night I have one in my community for Nicholas Inger who was shot and killed in Minneapolis who lived one mile from my house. Um, it's still an unsolved murder from almost a year ago. Um, so I want to thank you for bringing this forward. I hope it does work uh, because we need to put these uh, perpetrators behind bars. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Johnson. Um, uh, Chair becker Finn, um, you get the last word here. And um, Good bill. Thank you uh, for bringing it to us and uh, really appreciate uh, your testifiers here. But uh, Chair becker Finn. Yep. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Mariani. And I do mostly want to want to acknowledge my testifiers and thank them for their work. It is 
very difficult to live with this trauma every single day for a lot of families. Um, as I shared uh, in previous steps in, in dealing with this, this issue and this crisis, um, my, my great grandmother was murdered um, when my grandma was five years old and uh, on, on our, our homelands um, in the Cass Lake area. And so uh, I certainly have felt the reverberations of that trauma even generations later um, with how that impacted my grandma and um, everybody else in my family. And so um, it is, is personal. Um, I think to, to really uh, hit home on why this particular bill is really important, um, somebody knows. Somebody knows something about every single one of these cases. There are not, people don't just disappear. Somebody knows something. And, um, you know, whether it's, there's there's a young man, uh, you know, and, and I think this it's a missing and murdered indigenous relatives office because it, it does happen to, to men and boys too, you know, certainly help, felt more strongly by women um, and two-spirit folks. But uh, there's a young man who's been missing in my home community for six years now disappeared on Halloween night, somebody knows, somebody knows something. And the idea with this bill and this reward fund is that there's now some impetus to get that person who knows something to share that information um, so that we can work up these cases and we can get answers for the families because I think that's the least we can do for families is to give them some kind of closure and hope um, as they deal with these tragic uh, tragic incidents. And so I, I thank the committee for their time and thank you, Chair Mariani. Um, I know we went a little long, but I really appreciate the attention you're giving to this issue. Um, Chimi Gwich. Thank you, uh, Chair becker -Finn. Um, yeah, I, I've known this figure, but uh, it's still stunning when I hear these kind of figures, like the one the chief uh, shared earlier of, of our indigenous, his indigenous residents being six times more likely to be uh, uh, the victims of violent crimes. And that's, uh, I think, another argument for uh, this kind of focused um, effort to, to uh, get information so badly needed uh, in that reality. Uh, with that, uh, the chair uh, moves to, well, the chair, frankly, just uh, lays over House File 3055 for possible inclusion in this committee's omnibus bill. Thank you again, Ms. Goodrich, Ms. Day, Ms. Koslowski, and Chief uh, Tuscan for being with us here today. Um, with that, we'll move to uh, Representative Richardson's uh, House File 2849. And uh, Vice Chair um, Frazier, I'm going to lean on you again. Uh, no, actually, I don't, because we're going to lay this over. Now you get a day off, man. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we're going to lay this one over uh, as well for possible inclusion of another uh, very important bill. Uh, thank you for bringing this uh, uh, forward to us, uh, Representative Richardson. And so with that, the chair uh, uh, calls forward House File 2849. Uh, for possible inclusion in this committee's omnibus bill. Uh, with that, Representative Richardson, your bill is before us. Welcome. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. House File 2849 would build on the bipartisan work that began last session with the creation of the Missing and Murdered African American Women and Girls Task Force. I want to thank all the advocates and members who supported the work and also Senator Kunish for her efforts in the Senate. This bill would establish an office dedicated to addressing the known disparities and crisis of missing and murdered black women and girls in our state. The data is clear, unacceptable, and speaks to the urgency of the crisis and the need. The fact that cases involving black women and girls on average stay open and unresolved four times longer than cases um, than other cases reflects the systemic barriers and inequities. The fact that black girls are more likely to be classified as runaways rather than victims of foul play, which, trans which translates into black girls being less likely to receive Amber Alerts, media coverage, and immediate law enforcement resources reduces the chances of a safe recovery. While black Minnesotans account for less than 7% of the state population, in 2020, 40% of domestic violence homicide victims were black. There are also troubling disparities in human trafficking and sexual exploitation disparities. We know that Black women and girls are overrepresented and they're more likely to be victims. And at the same time, we also know they are less likely to attract sustained attention from the media and law enforcement. Black women and girls are systemically disadvantaged without equal access to resources. 
We know the issues are deep, multifaceted, and complex. When I presented the task force bill last year, I shared we couldn't talk about this crisis and root causes without exploring systemic racism and inequities. To move the need on the crisis, we need to address those inequities and we need to uncover the reasons that cases that involve black women and girls are staying unresolved longer. We also need to get to the root causes and work to prevent and reduce the incidences of violence. Um, and we, we have to confront intimate partner violence, domestic violence, gang violence, sexual exploitation, disparities in the child welfare system, examining the media's role, the impact of housing and food insecurity, analyzing resources for prevention and healing in the community, wrestling with historical trauma, and creating pathways to building trust between communities and systems that have not uh, operated equally for Black women and girls. This office is about building a long overdue infrastructure, one to address cold cases, track data for accountability, and to move beyond analyzing root causes to action to implement a blueprint for prevention and reduction in the incidence of violence in our state. We have lessons learned from the Indigenous Task Force, and I'm here today to sound the alarm that the crisis is continuing and intensifying. An, an office is long overdue to address the systemic public health and safety crisis. The current outcomes are predictable and we desperately need prevention resources. I would now like to turn it over to my first testifier, Dr. Peter Hayden. Well, thank you, Chair Richardson. With that, uh, we'll welcome uh, Mr. Peter Hayden. Uh, good to see you, sir. Welcome to our committee. Please state your name for the record and give us your testimony. Peter Hayden. Um, I'm the father of Jeff Hayden, who used to be a colleague of yours, and mm -hmm. some of you sitting at the uh, table with me, and it's good to see you. You knew his passion, and Representative, um, I, I, I really, uh, Richardson, I really appreciate you continuing this. As you know, I have a daughter six years ago, come July the 23rd, was taken from me and my family, and uh, I hear a lot of times they talk about indigenous people, African-American people, people of color, and that the police say, well, they just were run runaways. In this case, it wasn't a runaway. Taylor, Aaron, and Sydney graduated from YZ High School. One went to HBCU, another one went to Mississippi State, and the other one went to Mizzou. And uh, so it wasn't that pattern. Uh, Jeff was a senator. And uh, uh, so after my recovery in chemical health, I was able to do something. And now I'm stepping forward to you and just asking you to understand. I think you understand, but uh, go along with me, carrying my message uh, that uh, Black women uh, and girls cases are not, I mean, they just, it's almost people don't, after a year, no one's there for them uh, with regards to uh, chem uh, chemical health, mental health, and gun violence. That's the whole thing, because I say chemical health, mental health, only because uh, these issues have to do with the people who are perpetrating these crimes. So there needs to be other things. And I thank you, Representative, for asking for this bill, House File 2849, because it's so needed. And then the last part that I would like to talk about is that as a man, as a father, we have relationships with our kids and we don't understand why you would not under see the 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 compassion that I have? So thank you um, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, the structure that is being um, presented, I hope you will move forward with it on this house bill. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hayden. It's always good to see you. Um, we see and we acknowledge uh, your beloved Taylor, and we also acknowledge your wisdom in um, encouraging us to create systemic tools uh, to be able to address um, these systemic uh, cost outcomes um, that um, are part of 
of, of your loss and your family's loss of Taylor. Thank you for being with us here today. Thank you. Uh, with that, we next have uh, Lakeisha Lee, CEO of Fly Economics. Um, and Ms. Lee, if you can come forward, identify your name uh, for the record and uh, give us your testimony, we would be honored. Hello, everyone. My name is Lakeisha Lee. Thank you very much, Chair Mariani, for your continued support and allowing us here today to testify for House Bill number 2849. I'm a long-term advocate of missing and murdered Black women and girls here in the Twin Cities. Um, many of you may have heard of my sister, Brittany Clarity, who was who went missing in February of 2013. 10 days later, her body was found in her car in Columbia Heights, Minnesota. We live in the St. Paul Twin Cities area. From that time that she was missing, I was in contact with a lot of different police departments. Our family was connecting with many different resources, but it still wasn't clear that we were heard. It still didn't feel that we were being listened to because she had just turned 18 within six months of her going missing. We're the experts in our family on her and I thank you for your support with the creation of the state task force for missing and murdered black girls and women here in the Twin Cities. You're creating a blueprint. Um, and I believe that this bill would help, help us have a centralized place for the community to continue to put the recommendations that the task force will recommend into tangible, something tangible for our community. I'm asking for your support to include this in your omnibus bill to allow the recommendations and provide a place for us in the community because this is not stopping. This is continuing at an, continuing at an alarming rate. Our communities are continuing to be affected through horrendous cases, horrendous cases. It's continuing to keep us feeling unsafe. And this helps, this can help promote healing. This can be a place that provides resources and support and that the community and help com continue our commitment to community prevention. I thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lee. And I want you to know that we see, uh, we acknowledge the beloved humanity of your sister, Brittany Clary. It's important that we begin our work by seeing uh, one another and acknowledging the humanity of one another. That's at the root um, of systemic failures um, along race and class and otherisms that um, invite violence and, and harm to others. Uh, we grieve your family's loss and we welcome your guidance on this issue here today. Thank you for being with us. Um, next, we have um, Artika Rola, Executive Director of Minkasa. Um, welcome, Ms. Rola. It's always good to have you in committee. Please state your name uh, for the record and give us your testimony. My name is Artika Roller. Good afternoon, Chair Mariani, Representative Richardson, and members of this committee. Um, my sincere condolences to the families of the murdered and missing loved ones. Um, I am the Executive Director of the Minnesota Coalition Against Sexual Assault, MNCASA. MNCASA is a statewide coalition representing more than 66 programs that are providing services to victims and survivors of sexual assault across the entire state of Minnesota. During my 22 year career, I have been devoted to addressing sex trafficking, intimate partner violence and sexual assault, centering the needs of victims and survivors in my work. During my career, I have had the opportunity to see the best of humanity and unfortunately the opportunity to see the worst as well. As a director of service programs servicing women and girls, we experienced participants that were either missing or murdered several times a year. Unfortunately, the families that I worked with encountered many barriers to obtaining information and were overwhelmed 
by navigating the multiple systems they encountered, locating their loved ones or seeking justice for their loved ones. In 2019, the FBI estimates that there are 64,000 black women and girls that were missing. And in 2020, the National Crime Information Center estimates that there were over 90,000 black women and girls that were reported missing. This is a crisis and this is an urgency to understand what's happening to so many black women and girls. Resolving this crisis is critical to our public safety and to our community well-being. Mencasa fully supports House File 2849, the creation of an office for missing and murdered black women and girls. The office will build accountability, leverage responsibility, and facilitate resources and services to reduce and prevent violence. The office also will increase personnel that's focused on this issue, state resources that are dedicated to addressing murdered and missing African-American women's injustice. There has been lessons learned. Um, we believe that we can reduce the harm and save lives with the creation of this office. I would encourage us not to delay this work. It is long overdue and there is significant support right now to address this known crisis. I thank you for your opportunity to let me testify here today in the committee. Well, thank you, Executive Director Rolla. Um, and now we have uh, Suana Kirkland, um, National Vice Chair of the National Black Police Association. It's good to have you in committee again. Uh, Commander Kirkland, please uh, come forward, state your name for the record, and give us your testimony. Right. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, committee members. My name is Suwana Kirkland, and I am the National Vice Chair for the National Black Police Association. Um, last year, I had the privilege and the distinct honor to testify um, in front of uh, this committee to urge the creation uh, for the task force. Um, thank you to uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Richardson, uh, for your support um, and your leadership. Um, it's needed and it's needed now. Um, today, I urge the support for House File 2849 um, to create an office for missing and murdered black women and girls. This office is needed to bring hope, support, encouragement, resources, and crucial awareness for victims, families, and survivors. Um, time is of the essence, and that time is right now. Um, resources for cold cases, to, uh, to uh, build infrastructure and teams and support around that is needed and it's needed now. These incidents of violence, they're not uh, stopping. As I've heard here earlier, they're just escalating. And the numbers are growing and growing and growing. Uh, this is courageous work. Um, these women and girls that have gone missing and murdered, they look like my daughters. They look like your daughters. They look like your sisters and your mothers. So it's, in, it's vital and it's important and it's crucial. This is courageous work. It's gonna take courageous leadership. And so I thank this entire committee for putting the awareness on this and the priority on this. Families need hope. Families need hope. And it starts with this committee. And so I urge uh, this committee respectfully uh, to support the bill. And again, it's a privilege and an honor to uh, testify in front of you yet again. And uh, I support this bill as well as the National Black Police Association. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Commander Kirkland. With that, uh, Chair Richardson, uh, we'll open this up for uh, discussion and uh, questions of any committee members. Uh, we have uh, three hands up at this point. Uh, Representative, we'll start with Representative Claiborne. Chair and members, um, this message is really a personal one to Dr. Hayden. Dr. Hayden, Joyce and I worked together on a committee at Wayzata School years ago, 
and um, our daughters, <laughs> your Taylor, my Claire, would often pop into that committee. And um, I just want you to know that I remember warmly Taylor's smile, intelligence, and humor. And with Taylor's death, you know, our community lost a beautiful young woman. So I'm um, happy and proud to support this legislation in Taylor's honor. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Taylor? Thank you. I, uh, uh, she was just such a wonderful young lady. Dr. Hayden, I'm sorry. I, I transposed uh, your beloved's name uh, with your last name. Uh, my <laughs> apologies, Dr. Hayden. Yeah, she was just such a, a great young lady. And still today, they're wearing her T-shirts, you know, stop the violence at school, at school. And when they have a track meet, they put her, it, getting to the point was, I'm going to tell Joyce because that's going to help Joyce. It's nothing like a woman carrying a child for nine months and somebody else makes a choice that they're going to be God. And that's why I'm now standing forth, forward. Um, uh, and the representative, I just asked her to, that I thank her for letting me be the man, uh, Taylor's daddy, because ta Taylor loved me. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Hayden. Um, next, we have uh, uh, Representative uh, Poston. Thank you, Chair Mariani. My uh, question is for the bill author. Uh, Chair Richardson, um, we have an office uh, for missing, murdered, and indigenous relatives. Did you consider uh, combining uh, these two offices together uh, instead of having two offices that appear to me to be doing kind of the exact same thing uh, and having separate offices? Chair, Chair Richardson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Representative Poston, for the question. Um, we did not consider combining uh, the two offices um, because there are some uh, unique differences. Um, one, from the perspective of the Indigenous office, um, as sovereign nations, there are some um, distinct differences uh, with uh, the operation. And so um, that was not a, uh, a consideration um, in terms of bringing and bringing the bill uh, uh, forward. Representative Poston. Thank you, Chair Richardson. I understand. Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, Representative Raleigh. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, got a couple uh, questions for the author. Uh, the first one was along the lines of what uh, Representative Poston just asked. In the establishment of the office, um, is this going to be like a standalone office? Is it going to require um, like office equipment, like printers, computers, things like that? Uh, the reason I'm asking is go along the lines of what Representative Poston is asking. Do you think that this new office will be able to be located within another office? Or is this going to be establishing a brand new, uh, basically, you're going to stand up a new office from scratch? Chair Richardson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Raleigh, for your questions. The uh, intent of the bill is to establish a new office under the um, Office of Justice uh, Programs. So it would be establishing a new standalone office. That is the intent. Representative Raleigh. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So um, I've got two questions along those lines then. If we go to um, page three, starting at 3.29, the bill does say that it encourages um, the organization to, in fulfilling its duty, the office may coordinate as useful with stakeholder groups and others. And then it also talks about uh, some pretty, um, uh, pretty laid out reporting that's going to be done. And I'm wondering, wouldn't it be more advantageous for data practices and data sharing, especially as we're looking at like statistical analysis uh, over a long period of time, would it not be better to be in an office that is at least physically within the same uh, area as another organization um, that's doing basically the same work Although in different uh, different orbits, one, as you've said, would be you know in coordination with the um, 
uh, with the indigenous tribes and such, and others in various uh, areas of our communities. And, I, and I'm guessing that these communities are not gonna be just um, located in the metro area. So I'm, I'm wondering where do you think this office is gonna be and, and could we coordinate with the Office of Murdered Indigenous uh, Peoples? Mr. Chair. Uh, Chair Richardson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Representative Raleigh, for the uh, for the question. Um, in terms of the coordination um, with uh, other organizations, that is uh, definitely the intent. There's uh, current um, coordination that's happening right now within uh, the task force. I think it's really important to um, acknowledge that there are distinct um, differences. And as we are thinking about the, the resource um, uh, coordination and the development as well, we know right now that um, with uh, coordinated efforts, cases that are involving black women and girls stay open four times longer than cases involving other individuals. And so if we're not focused on the issue at hand, the issue gets lost. And so the idea of standing up a standalone office is really an opportunity for the needs of the indigenous community to be highlighted and to be met. And then also to ensure that the disparities that we are seeing within the black community, that they're not getting lost in sort of the whole uh, sort of complex of the um, of the challenges that are occurring. In addition to cases staying open longer, we know that there are issues around um, Amber uh, Alerts. Mm -hmm. We know that there are issues around um, sexual exploitation as well. And so the idea of having dedicated standalone resources is the ability for there to be true community response to the issues that are most critical uh, to the office based on what we know with the data uh, right now and based on what we're we're able to determine when we begin to uh, track uh, for accountability in the future, um, all of the reporting requirements that are within the bill. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, all of the things that you said right now, I think could be accomplished with a, um, a, sh uh, a space that is dedicated to exactly what you're saying. Although, you know, it's only, this is only $500,000 and I, I say that you know, understanding that $500,000 is an awful lot of money. Once this office is stood up, I would like to see as much of that money going towards the good work you're talking about instead of printers and computers and so forth. And, and that's what I'm encouraging. And I'm not trying to be adversarial at all. It's just in looking at standing up an office, I think there's an opportunity to utilize currently available um, technologies and currently available space. Last question I've got, Mr. Chair, is uh, page four, subdivision five underneath the reports. Um, throughout the bill, it talks an awful lot about uh, the communities and the individuals that are going to be served. And I've got two questions on the report side. Um, do you envision, uh, or, or I'm, I should ask it this way, what type of demographic information are you envisioning being made available in those reports? Uh, because it does talk about um, uh, being able to talk about the measurable outcomes. And so I'd like to find out what kind of demographics will you be uh, putting into those reports? And then um, along the lines of the outcomes, do you expect the same type of demographic information to be included in those reports on any of the closed, um, um, uh, any of these uh, um, incidents? And I'm trying to use the right words, uh, Representative Richardson. If if uh, if something is closed and we find the perpetrator and we're able to um, get it to the end of either adjudicating or finding out what happened, is there going to be data on the perpetrators, not just the victims? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chair Richardson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. So, uh, Representative uh, Raleigh, to your questions, um, you know, in, in terms of the uh, the funding piece, uh, the funding within this bill, you're correct, it's uh, $500,000 a year, but the intent within the bill is that the office would also have the structure in place in order to um, secure grants as well. So foundational support um, and, and federal uh, support um, uh, 
uh, as well would be an, an important uh, piece of that. In terms of the reports and getting to the um, uh, some of the root causes pieces, the type of data that uh, we have discussed being collected not only goes to the number of, of missing um, cases within the state, um, the number of homicide uh, cases, uh, uh, case closure um, timeline pieces, tracking AMBER alerts um, within the state are examples of the type of data that would be um, considered. And when we're having these conversations around um, the, uh, intimate partner violence and uh, we're having the uh, conversations around uh, the rates of homicide related to that, we are looking at all of the factors, um, in, including um, the, uh, the, the demographics of, of uh, domestic violence incidences as well. Very well. Last, last follow-up, Mr. Chair. Uh, Real quick, quick, 10 seconds. Um, there, in, uh, in the bill, it says that there is going to be um, a report from the Task Force on Missing and Murdered African-American Women. Have you seen that report yet? Uh, Chair Richardson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The report is due at the end of this year. Got it. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I'm done, Mr. Chair. Very well. Representative Hollins. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. And I, I really wanted to take a moment to, to thank uh, Representative Richardson for bringing this forward. I think um, the, the conversation that we're having about combining resources, I understand that it's coming from a good place, but I think recognizing that the grants that um, both different offices would be applying to are gonna be vastly different. And I would also, um, you know, I would love to highlight the amount of money and resources that we spend searching for, uh, you know, missing and murdered uh, white women in particular, but certainly just individuals in general, far exceeds the amount of money that we are looking to invest in either one of those two offices. And so um, I, I really commend Representative Richardson for bringing this forward. I think this is powerful and important and um, our communities deserve justice as well. Thank you. Well, well thank you, uh, Representative Hollins. And, and um, uh, by the way, there's nothing, I, I don't think there's anything in the bill that prevents um, offices from co-locating. That's a pretty common practice. Um, you know, in our state where you can still have very distinct office functions, right? Uh, but where there might be a co-locating of, of services plus the ability to access uh, resources from larger agencies. That's uh, it's a good efficient way to work but while we're also maintaining uh, the very distinct uh, integrity uh, of an office like this that uh, is called upon to respond to uh, arguably a very distinct uh, reality um, that, that exists in our state. Um, Members, um, I, I'm told that there was a public testifier. I apologize. I jumped over. I still have two members here, but um, very quickly, um, let me see if Aisha Abdullahi is here. You can come forward. Yes, Mr. Chair. Welcome uh, to the committee. We're a little pressed for time, but we certainly uh, uh, want to hear your voice. So you can give us your name uh, for the record and give us your concise testimony, we greatly appreciate it. Welcome. Welcome. Uh, thank you so much. Um, my name is Aisha Abdullahi um, and Chair Mariani, Representative Johnson and members of the Public Safety Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on the Missing and Murdered Black Women and Girls Bill today. Um, my name is Aisha once again, and I'm from, I'm a Minnesota native, currently pursuing my master's um, in public policy at Duke University. Prior to coming to Duke, I worked as a civic engagement coordinator uh, for RISE um, in Minneapolis, a nonprofit organization uh, that engages young Muslim women in grassroots activism and amplifies their voice to create systemic change. Uh, this past year, COVID really changed um, and challenged many lives, especially for young African American girls across the nation. Despite the lack of attention in the news media, approximately 100,000 Black girls and women went missing in the United States last year. Some have been trafficked, while others have been abducted by close friends or strangers, yet very few of these cases received attention from mainstream media. In contrast to missing white women, many families and friends of missing Black women and girls have trouble getting the police to take their cases seriously. It took police in Connecticut more than a month after the death of a Black woman to begin a criminal investigation, 
once again highlighting how racial bias can contribute to the lack of urgency when it comes to the lives of Black girls and women. As a first-generation college graduate, I'm privileged to sit here today during white during Women's History Month and tell you my story as a Young Women's Initiative cabinet member. But that is not the case for many young girls like me. The invisibility of missing Black girls and women reveals how they have been denied citizenship, and as a result, they are unprotected, punished, or unnoticed. Black women deserve more. Black families deserve more. Representative Richardson's bill is the first step Minnesota can take towards addressing the inequalities present in our public safety system. We must ensure the protection of Black women as a priority, and that can only be accomplished with your support today. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I urge the committee to move this bill forward and to help Minnesotans across the nation. Ms. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, testimony, Ms. Abdullahi. Uh, members, we have uh, two members left uh, with their hands up. We still have the Highlands Bill I want to get to. We have about 20 minutes left. And so I am going to ask you to be real brief. Um, and if you're not, uh, I'm giving you a forewarning that I'm not going to allow us to uh, uh, not get to the next bill. So please work with me here on this. Uh, Representative Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Many thanks to Representative Richardson and all the really powerful testifiers. All I wanted to note in response to Representative Raleigh's questions and your comment, Mr. Chair, is um, to note that the bill does place this office within the Office of Justice Programs. And just to highlight that the needs are really distinct, and this is a distinct office, and it will be with other programs. I guess I would expect they would co-locate. If Representative Richardson correct, could correct me. Um, but it's with other programs that address a number of issues. So um, I don't think that those are concerns. It looks like it's a well-crafted to build that really takes a distinctive, addresses a distinctive need, but within a broader coordinated approach. So many thanks again, uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Richardson. Yeah, I concur, and I do appreciate Representative Raleigh's uh, line of opportunity because it allows the opportunity to share that uh, reality that does exist across, um, across our state. Representative Johnson. Uh, Chair Mariani, I just got a couple comments and a couple questions. I'll start out uh, Representative with Representative Johnson, couple. I have um, 15 minutes left. I want to uh, get to the other bill, um, and so I, I, I want to really encourage you collegially to move as quickly as you can here. I, uh, Chair Mary Ann, I will. I, Representative Richardson, uh, couple, to start out with a couple of things. One, I don't see a fiscal note. As it one, one of your notes, one had been requested. And uh, the second part of it, since uh, the funding is only for the first year, and there's directors and staffs and para and only $500,000 allocated to this. Uh, what happens next year to the office if there is no grants available? Because in the funding bill, there is no office funding for the next year. Fair questions, uh, Chair uh, Richardson. Thank you, uh, Chair Mariani. Uh, Representative Johnson, when working uh, with uh, staff on crafting the bill, I asked the same question around the 500000 and was informed that the 500,000 would be in the tails. And so that would continue beyond um, and worked um, with uh, ben, uh, ben Johnson on that as well. And so I don't know if um, staff is uh, here to um, uh, share the response that I was given when, asking, when asked that same question about the 500,000 in fiscal year, because the intent is that that would be 500,000 uh, that would continue per year. So we have the uh, chairs in tech. That might be a question for Mr. Walls. Uh, certainly something that uh, having your intent, uh, something that we can uh, subsequently uh, craft. Um, Mr. Chair? Yes, Mr. Walls, please. Uh, Mr. Chair, so the bill is drafted and it mentions that the funding is in fiscal 2023. That's the second year of the biennium. Uh, by our, the rules that we follow with MMB, any uh, funding in the second year that is not noted as one-time funding is considered ongoing. Very well. Uh, Representative Johnson. I, I appreciate that, but I still think that dollar amount, I, I would still love to see a fiscal note because just looking at the amount of staff, uh, a director is going to take uh, with Para and Pen and uh, uh, benefits and everything is going to take about 25% or more of that, probably more of that alone. And it's not, not going to leave much for staff or any work to be done. 
Um, so I think that's going to be a low number. So I think we really do need a fiscal note on this bill so we know what's actually involved in it. I, I understand the, I understand the concept of this, and I do believe that uh, it could do uh, could work just fine combined with one director working both because the staff know what they're doing. They need to know what they're doing, and the director could direct both. That would save funds. Um, I. I like the, I understand the concept of this, uh, but I do have some concerns as, because I don't know how many employees this is going to actually be. I haven't heard the number in the other, uh, the you know, murdered in, indigenous, uh, indigenous people and relatives. I'm not sure how many, I haven't heard how many staff that ended up with as well. So it, uh, I do have concerns. I know this is going to be laid over and, uh, I'll just end it right there for now. Well, President Johnson, your, your questions are actually very good questions. I, I concur. It's why we have fiscal notes, and uh, there's lots of different ways that we can configure this. My understanding, uh, Chair Richardson, my staff is sending me a, a, a message here that the, the bill, because of the, uh, apparently the language in it is going to require a stop at judiciary. Uh, is that your understanding? Oh, Correct. Okay. Yes, uh, so, this, yes, this would require a stop in judiciary. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm going to be changing the motion. However, I do expect this bill back here. Um, and uh, precisely for the kind of questions that Representative Johnson uh, has just raised. Um, very well. Uh, Representative Richardson, I'll let you uh, give us uh, you know, a few seconds of closing out. I'm going to change the motion, see if we can get your bill properly before another committee needs to look at it. Um, I'll be communicating with the, that chair about the return path of this, of this committee. Uh, Representative, or Chair uh, Richardson. Uh, thank you, Chair Mariani, for the opportunity to present this uh, bill today and also for the work um, to get the task force um, set up as well. We've heard multiple times today how um, personal um, this this bill and this office is to um, to so many, and the heartbreaking piece of this is that uh, so many of us have our own personal stories to share. I have a cousin who has been missing for over a decade with no trace. We have no idea what happened, um, what occurred. There's lots of rumors, and as Rep. Becker Fenn talked about, someone knows. Um, what occurred. And we know uh, that this is a crisis. We know that this is an issue. We know that $500,000 is not enough to address this entire crisis, but it's a start. It is a beginning. And um, I hope that there is uh, support uh, for this bill because we owe this uh, to, to Minnesotans. Um, we, we owe it to um, the families. We owe it um, to the survivors. And um, for everyone out there who is waiting for a loved one um, uh, to, to come home, um, we hope that we can move this forward in honor of your of their loved ones. Um, thank you, Representative, or thank you, Chair Mariani. Very well, thank you, uh, Chair Richardson. Uh, the, the chair then uh, uh, changes his intent. We had a uh, basically the chair called this forward for. Um, possible inclusion, uh, but learning that it's got to make a stop in another committee, that doesn't make sense unless the bill is possibly going to die here, which is not our intent. So the chair moves and House File, what happened to my number? House File 2849, we did not amend it, be referred to the Committee on Judiciary. Um, the uh, clerk will take the roll on that motion. Chair Mariani. Aye. Chair Mariani, aye. Vice Chair Frazier? Aye. Vice Chair Frazier, aye. Representative Johnson? Aye. We'll deal with it in judiciary. Representative Johnson, aye. Representative Edelson? Aye. Representative Edelson, aye. Representative Feist? Aye. Representative Feist, aye. Representative Grossel? Aye. Representative, Representative Grossel, aye. Representative Hollins? Aye. Aye. Representative Feist? Aye. Aye. Representative Representative Holland, aye. aye. Representative aye. Hewitt? Aye. Representative aye. Hewitt? Aye. Representative Cleborn? Cleborn, aye. Representative Cleborn? Aye. Representative Long? Aye. Representative Hewitt? Aye. Body, aye. 
Rep Representative Long. Representative Lucero. Representative Lucero. Lucero, yes. Representative Mueller. Mueller votes yes. Re Representative Mueller, aye. Representative Novotny. Novotny, aye. I apologize for the echo. Repres Representative, Nova Nova Representative Novotny, aye. Representative O'Neill. O'Neill, aye. Representative O'Neill, aye. Representative Pinto. Aye. Representative Pinto, aye. Representative Poston. Aye. Representative Poston, aye. Re Representative Raleigh. Raleigh, aye. Representative Raleigh, aye. Representative Vang. Aye. Representative Vang, aye. Representative Chong. Aye. Representative Chong, aye. And coming back to Representative Long. And that concludes roll call with 18 ayes, zero nays, and one absent. Very well. With uh, a vote of 18 ayes, zero nays, and one absent, the most one absence, the motion prevails, and House File 2849 is referred to the Judiciary Committee. Representative Chair Richardson, thank you uh, for the bill, and thank you to all the testifiers as well. Members, we're not going to act on the other bill. Um, I was informed that I had not, uh, you know, given the custom and usage time for action uh, of the bill, but nonetheless, it's important uh, to have an informational hearing on House File 3856. So the chair is going to bring that bill Chair forward. Mariani. And uh, hold on a second. The chair is going to bring that bill forward, and then we'll try to uh, get um, as many of the testifiers as possible. We will then um, uh, have a... Uh, a formal uh, consideration of the bill at a future date. Uh, Representative Johnson. Uh, I just wanted to uh, bring up some issues, uh, especially not particularly to this bill, but uh, what happened with this bill. It, uh, it mysteriously appeared on the committee web website. And as far as we can tell, it appeared less than 24 hours before this, this committee. Uh, House rules require that uh, the agenda and stuff be set three days in advance. We also have a bill tomorrow. It's borderline if it made to three days, although it's a bill we've heard before. But even what's more astonishing is with this bill, it was put up there. And I didn't hear about it until it was after the amendment deadline. The amendment deadline is noon. I was advised about it by somebody outside this, this building Representative Johnson, After I, have two seven, I have seven minutes left and I have a number of testifiers who expect to testify on this bill. I have already conceded, you and I had this conversation, that uh, it, it, it is in the chair's estimation, and there is discretion, by the way, in the rule for the chair. It's, it's the chair's uh, call that we not act on this bill formally before us, uh, precisely because I want to make sure that the public has the kind of notice that customarily uh, we provide. So, Representative Johnson, I don't want to use up the time of the testifiers. If you want, you can bring up this issue the next time we come together, and I'll give you 10 minutes to uh, go through through that entire thing that you want to share. But at this point, I want to move forward with our testimony. I, I, I do trust that if there is a public testimony that uh, on this bill that uh, wishes come up the next time when this bill is brought up again, they will be allowed because usually what happens most likely the they testimony. will. Representative Johnson, most likely they will. With that, uh, Representative Hollins, your bill uh, is not formally before us, but we are having an informational hearing. You have several testifiers, um, and uh, perhaps Representative Hollins, you can do like a quick 10 second introduction, uh, and then we'll go to your testifiers as quickly as possible. Rep Representative Hollins. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members of the committee. Um, I will touch on this bill very quickly and then ask my testifiers to um, discuss it. So um, House File 3856, or the Survivors Justice Act, does two main things. First, it encourages judges to depart from the applicable sentencing guidelines by presuming a departure is appropriate where the criminal conduct was the result of an experience of victimization. Um, second, it grants an opportunity for resentencing to those currently serving a sentence that might have been lower had they have had the benefit of the encouraged victim-centered departure in this bill. Boom. 
now we can go to test fires. Um, I live free Minnesota. Katie Kramer, please come forward. Uh, good afternoon, Chair. Uh, if the author and the chair are willing, I would love to prioritize the testimony of Samantha, uh, who's an impacted person, and Nicole Matthews with the Minnesota Indian Women's Sexual Assault Coalition, and then circle back to me if there's time. I'd just love, love to prioritize their testimony if you're willing. Right, very well. So the next person is Kendra Saitoff. Is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Hi, Chair Mariani. I <laughs> like to... Oh, sorry. No, Hi. You're welcome. Thank you. I just want to echo what Katie said. I'd love to prioritize Samantha and Nicole's testimony. Okay. Right. And if there's time to go back very, to me. Thank very you. Well. Very well. Samantha, please come forward. State your name for the record and give us your testimony. All right. Um, I'm Samantha Hyges, um, Chair Mariani and members of the committee. I'm testifying today in support of the Survivors Justice Act, House File 3856. On December 13th, 2021, the Board of Pardons unanimously granted me clemency. A year ago today, I would have never imagined that I would be a free woman with the opportunity to tell lawmakers about the importance for second chances for people like myself. <clears throat> At the age of 19, I committed an unspeakable act, terrified and alone with an abusive boyfriend who had isolated me from my family, friends, and medical professionals. I gave birth to my daughter in the bathtub of an apartment we shared. Shortly after the birth, and as a result of my boyfriend's threats to kill both of us, if I did not do it myself, I drowned my baby in the bathwater, thinking it was the kindest thing to do in the moment. When the enormity of what I had done hit me, I attempted suicide a few days later um, by slitting my wrist in the same tub. Um, I labored with my secret for years, but eventually broke down and confided in someone who alerted the police. I was arrested, prosecuted, and convicted at trial of second degree murder. I was set sentenced to 25 years in custody. My abuser was never held accountable because under advice of counsel, with my appeal pending, I refused to testify against him. I live with the consequences of my actions every day and I off offer up each day an atonement. When I entered into MCF shock 13 years ago, I vowed to take the opportunity to not only reflect on my past, but also grow from it. I took countless groups like grief and loss and surviving violence. In these groups, I was able to begin processing my life and the choices that led me there. I also jumped at every chance possible to grow and learn as an individual from groups to restorative justice projects, to getting my education with a certificate in office support, two associates of arts degrees and graduating with honors uh, with a bachelor's degree in communications. I also con uh, contributed to my community by training service dogs, helping others as a conflict coach, and by being a positive peer in the Warden's Positive Peer Culture Group. Above all, I dedicated myself to the best possible, to being the best possible mother I could be to my living daughter, who was born a year before I entered prison. Even while being incarcerated with the help of my family, I was able to be an amazing and involved mom. During my time in prison, I came to realize my full potential and see what I have to offer this world. And luckily for me, I was one of the few to get the second chance from the Board of Pardons. I will be forever grateful that Governor Walls, Attorney General Ellison, and Chief Justice Gilday believed in me. I am also grateful to my sentencing judge who wrote in support of my clemency petition. I have been out for just over two months and I already have employment. I'm a fully involved parent. I am part of the COVID Confidence Committee through the U of M, and I am continuing to look for ways to give back. There are others just like me who have committed crimes in the context of, and as a result of their experience of an abusive relationship. Most cannot get counsel for their clemency cases, like I was, leading to the individualized review to the Board of Pardons was able to do. If I had not been granted my clemency, I would still be in prison for another four years. There was no mechanism for me to be released. So I ask you to pass this bill because it will give second chances to so many more like me. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony, um, Ms. Hodges, and um, a tough issue. Um, um, it's important that the people's body uh, deal with tough issues. Uh, please continue on your path uh, for redemption uh, in, in good Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, Nicole Matthews. 
Thank you, um, Chair Mariani and members of the committee. Nicole Matthew Jaganashi Mung, Manidu Baneshi Kwe Indigo, Migazi and Dodame, Gawa Babagana Kag and Dunjaba. My English name is Nicole Matthews and my Indian name is Spirit Bird Woman. I'm Eagle Clan and I'm from the White Earth Band of Ojibwe. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Indian Women's Sexual Assault Coalition. We are a statewide tribal coalition serving 40 member programs and 117 individual members. We collaborated with the Minnesota Department of Corrections, Violence Free Minnesota, and the Northwest Indian Community Development Center on a project designed to improve criminal justice responses to victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking. We interviewed 62 Native American women, 29 women we're currently incarcerated at Shakopee Prison at the time of the interview, and 33 women were incarcerated at Shakopee within the previous five years. On any given day, Native women make up 20% of the prison population in Shakopee. This contrasts with Native American men who make up approximately 8% of the male prison population, and we make up only about 1% of our state's population. The interviews revealed the many ways that victimization can lead to incarceration for Native women in Minnesota and what services and supports may effectively break that cycle. Some of the information that we learned from the interviews include all but one of the women that we spoke to had a history of relationship abuse. In fact, 97% had a history of relationship abuse or sexual violence prior to their incarceration. Most of the women experienced multiple forms of violence prior to incarceration. One woman told us, starting at the age of 10, I was getting in trouble for truancy. I got molested at that age and never reported it. And that's when I started running away. Only one third of the women sought out advocacy services for support. And only one third of the women reported their experiences to law enforcement. One woman said, when I was 11 or 12, I told my mom that her husband was sexually abusing me. My grandma told me not to tell anyone else about it. My mom left him for a while, but it didn't last. I ran away. When I was 18, I reported all that he did to me, and they said that I waited too long. He never faced any charges. Many of the women drew direct and indirect connections between the violence and abuse they experienced and their involvement in the criminal justice system. One woman said, I was with an abusive boyfriend and I took the charge for him. He stole a bunch of stuff and brought it out to my car and they charged me since it was my car. I didn't think I could be held accountable for it and I wanted to take it to trial. 75% of the participants identified themselves as having a mental illness, PTSD from prior trauma, anxiety and depression were the most prevalent. It was critical to most of the women that they return to the communities where their children and families were located. Reestablishing relationships with their children was of high importance. Our Native people are deeply impacted by colonization and historical trauma, which often leads to violence and abuse and sometimes leads to incarceration. Criminalization should never be the penalty for victimization. These survivors are members of our communities and they deserve to have support to find healing and return to their children and families. They deserve to have supportive services and compassionate systems responses. The Survivors Justice Act is a great step in that direction and one that Minnesota must pass to support victims and survivors. Chimi Gwich, thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Matthews. Uh, I wanna thank uh, um, your grace and Samantha's and Katie and, and Kendra um, uh, as well. I am out of time. Um, and uh, I hope that uh, uh, Katie and Ms. Uh, uh, Ms. Kramer and Ms. Uh, Satoff, hopefully we can have you back. I will work with our uh, minority lead to make sure that we've got the bill uh, before us in a form where it can be properly vetted and, and acted upon. Uh, meanwhile, thank you for uh, this very difficult work uh, that you are about and uh, for uh, challenging us to look beyond uh, the old ways of looking at things so that we can close these cycles of, of violence in our state. Representative Holland, so last few seconds and then I'm just going to uh, conclude since we don't have the bill before us, uh, but we will have this bill back. Uh, Representative Hollins. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, committee members. I know that this is a really difficult topic, but um, I think it's an important one and I appreciate your time.
I also want to thank the testifiers today for um, speaking about their experiences, which must be really difficult. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Representative Holland. Members, so uh, that concludes our business uh, for today. We will uh, uh, adjourn again uh, tomorrow morning at our regular uh, Friday morning slot. Until then, please have a good evening, and we'll see you all tomorrow. This committee stands adjourned.